Hi, welcome everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm Susie Morgani and I'm the editor here at CRS and you are all very welcome. Without further ado, I will introduce our speakers for tonight. Zaid Musawi, uh, on my far left, is the Office Director of the Secretary General at the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy. Zaid and his team have worked across several areas of the World Cup preparations. Among Zaid's achievements is developing the 22 World Cup Impact Study, building and running the Qatar Community Football League, devising tournament-related strategies, and before joining uh, the SC, Zaid worked for Boozen Company in London, and he was also a chartered civil engineer and spent five years working on the London 2012 Olympic Games. So, a man of many talents. <laughs> so, Alexandra Shallot uh, is director of World Cup Legacy at Qatar Foundation. She oversees the leg legacy strategy of the FIFA World Cup 2022 at QF. For the last 13 years, she has worked and lived in over 20 countries, curating projects and partnerships with high-level experts in politics, tech, innovation, shared value, and ethics uh, to address sports' role in hard-hitting issues like the refugee crisis, uh, youth gun crime, and racial and religious and ethnic divides. Round of applause for Alexandra. <laughs> And finally, last but certainly not least, is Daniel Reiche, who is a visiting uh, research fellow at CIRS and a visiting associate professor at Georgetown University in Qatar, uh, where he leads the CIRS uh, research initiative on Qatar and the World Cup 2022 for the last couple of years. Uh, with Paul, uh, Paul Brannigan, he published the book Qatar and the 2022 FIFA World Cup, Politics, Controversy and Change, and he edited the volume Handbook of Sport in the Middle East. Round of applause for Daniel Rey. And those books are also available for purchase at our bookstore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, to our panelists, uh, who are going to uh, speak about five minutes each per question. Uh, and then I'll open the floor up uh, to audience questions. So we're all here to reflect on the World Cup. It's been a few months now. Um, so Zaid, looking back at the World Cup, um, how would you currently describe the legacy? Is this working? Yes, okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to this wonderful uh, uh, study. So, um, great question, and um, I'll try and keep it to five minutes. So, legacy as a whole, um, it's quite a subjective affair. So, um, everybody's just watched the World Cup, and everybody has feelings about the World Cup, and that, to them, is their own legacy. So, um, whether you took your small children to their first World Cup game, or whether, like me, you worked on the tournament for 11 years, you'll have different thoughts and feelings about what your personal legacy is. What we tried to do was to develop a structure to that legacy, and we put it into two main parts to start off with. So we've got the short-term legacy, which is what you're feeling right now. Um, was the tournament a success? Was it exciting? Was there lots of goals? You know, How do you feel about attending the games? Were you happy that Argentina won? And those were certain things that you have to build towards, and then other parts of it, you're lucky, depending on how the games play out. But certain things that we were key messaging that we wanted to bring through. The first one was that we really wanted people to understand Qatar, and that the tournament was well organized. And I think that that came across, certainly in the messaging that came through. The games went very, very well. And certainly as an organizing committee, we were very, very happy with that. The second thing we were really keen on was to, for people around the world and people visiting to understand Qatar and the region. Um, it's so often misunderstood. Um, you you um, and everybody here um, certainly will, will understand that the media sometimes portray Qatar in their own way, uh, but this was our opportunity to tell our story. And again, I think that came across really, really well. We interviewed, um, well, we surveyed a lot of people who came to Qatar, and we had around 89% of them said that they thought that um, Qatar was an amazing location and they'd certainly like to come back um, uh, as a tourist in the future. We also um, surveyed um, residents here in Qatar and 96% of them thought it was an amazing tournament and they were super, super happy with the result as well. So happy from that perspective. And the third thing on the short-term short side is uh, something that we couldn't predict but we hoped um, and that was the 
the, the unity that came through from um, the Arab teams doing so well in the tournament. From Saudi Arabia, I mean, I was very, very fortunate. I was at, at that game, and at that time, I, th I think we were under quite a lot of pressure. The media was still, you know, writing the stories that media likes to write. And, you know, I just happened to be in the stadium, and, and Argentina were winning 1-0, and I was surrounded by some guys. I was like, should I, you know, hang around? Should I watch the second half, or do, should I go and do some work? I wasn't really too sure. And then the next thing you know, there's there's a big scream and a shout, and you go you go to see, and all of a sudden there's a goal. It's one one, and then a few few moments later it's two one, and at that moment, uh, social media exploded, the world World Cup exploded, and then it, we never looked um, back after that. We had Gianni and Fantino saying it was the best group stages ever. We had Gianni and Fantino saying it was the best World Cup ever. We had the BBC doing a poll after the World Cup saying that it was. 78% uh, of people thought it was the best World Cup in, in uh, this century. So in terms of short term, uh, because of the game, because of, um, as well, elements that we've been saying for a long time, but not many people were listening. Um, uh, the fact that it was a compact tournament meant that players could rest a lot more than other tournaments. Um, we've had before as we had um, Russia, before as we had Brazil, where players were traveling for three, four hours on, on flights uh, getting to different locations. It was difficult for these people to perform. Um, issues where people were giving us trouble about um, changing the date from the summer to um, the perceived winter, but November, December. It meant that players were a lot fresher. So games were a lot more exciting. And one of the main things that came from that is we scored the most amount of goals uh, in any World Cup before. So lots and lots of great stuff, lots and lots of data. And just in the short term, we were really, really happy from that legacy perspective, um, that, that emotional uh, perspective that people will remember the tournament for. Um, so super happy with that. The longer term objectives, that's the harder stuff. That's the um, winning in extra time, as I would like to call it. You know, Argentina had to do that against uh, France. And that's when you really have to dig in and, and show um, that you walk the walk and you don't just talk the talk. And that's, this is the, sex, uh, the part that we're in now. So very briefly, I just want to give some high-level numbers from the impact study that we've developed. So um, in terms of economic benefit, um, the state of Qatar, roughly speaking, has invested about $12.4 billion into the development of the tournament. Um, you may have heard the number $200 billion. Um, these are, those numbers were associated with um, infrastructure that was already pre-planned before the tournament, but the actual numbers associated with um, this tournament was roughly 12.4 billion. Um, that generated an economic impact of 16.3 billion dollars. So roughly about a four billion uh, impact for Qatar in terms of money in and money out. So happy to talk. I'm not going to talk about that for too long because that will go longer than the five minutes I've already exceeded. Exceeded. Um, very quickly, social impact. We can talk about Generation Amazing just for an example. They um, impacted. Um, and, and supported over 1 million uh, people from around 70 different countries around the world. Uh, they're a really, really cool, um, uh, our main CSR uh, program, and they've become a foundation afterwards. They're going to be doing lots of really, really interesting things in legacy. From a human uh, aspect, you can look at volunteers or you can look at workers' welfare and all the positive benefits we've had from that. From a human side, we had a lot of people who were advocates from, from the beginning and now working closely with us and saying, we're now best in class. Uh, an excellent legacy in the story doesn't finish there. That will hopefully continue. Environmental impact, we look at um, the first carbon uh, neutral World Cup ever. And then on top of that, GSAS built stadiums. So the fact that we're the first World Cup to not only have construction and design um, based to um, sustainable standards, but we're also had operations as well. I could go on and on and on, but I know I've exceeded my five minutes, so I'll leave it there and happy to talk about anything with anyone later. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think certainly there's consensus that it was the most exciting World Cup final ever, right? Uh, so Lex, um, what do you think is the biggest legacy of the World Cup? Um, well, I think that Zayed right, is right that we can talk for, for way longer than five minutes on it, and I think that's a really good thing, right? Like, I think it would be actually a shame if we could do this all in, in five minutes, but um, just to sort of complement Zayed's work and the amazing work of the Supreme Committee, 
what our role at Qatar Foundation really was, when, as it pertained to legacy, was sort of twofold. The first was to support the Supreme Committee and everything that Zaid just shared from QF's perspective. How can we use our assets, our resources, our amazing students, our brilliant professors, um, the, the facilities that we have, the knowledge that we have for the over 25 years in research, et cetera. How can we support the Supreme Committee and what they're trying to achieve? And the second part of it is how can we use the platform of the World Cup and the attention that the World Cup will bring to further Qatar Foundation's objectives. And where that kind of comes into play is specifically around sustainability and innovation, which is a huge value for QF, um, as well as kind of culture and heritage. They touched upon that a little bit around unifying um, the Arab world, but obviously a value and an objective for Q Qatar Foundation is preserving the Arabic language, connecting the next generation to their history and heritage as it pertains to the Arab world and specifically Qatar. And the final one, which is really near and dear to my heart and really what we saw kind of come to life through the World Cup is accessibility and inclusion. And I think that from, from my perspective, that really will be hopefully the biggest um, achievement from Qatar's Qatar Foundation's perspective around legacy. Um, specifically, the World Cup set out to be the most accessible World Cup ever. Um, Qatar Foundation really um, positioned itself and um, contributed to that uh, objective and really leaned into that. So we did that through many ways. We supported on the training of the accessibility volunteers, which was the first kind of iteration of FIFA volunteers that were specifically geared towards being trained up to be able to advise people who had different abilities on how to get to the matches in the best way, where they could go, what that looked like. So QF, with our expertise, did all of that, did that training with the Supreme Committee um, and then helped support and organize that. We also developed the first ever World Cup Accessibility Guide, which was on Qatar tourism, it was on Haya, it was on various websites, and any fan could go to, the, go to that guide and essentially assess the best and easiest way for them to get to the match. Um, from the last mile all the way to transport, but also which activations were the most accessible. Um, we also supported on the design and the um, positioning of the sensory havens and the sensory rooms. So I don't know how many of you all know this, but every single stadium had a sensory room um, for people who, who had different abilities who needed to kind of decompress, which meant that people who could never ever experience a World Cup match ever before could go. Um, that was a world first, and we're now advising um, future World Cup organizers, included United 2026, on this approach in terms of how you kind of accommodate this. Um, so from an accessibility perspective, that was massive because we're advising World Cups to, um, to do this uh, in future. But also it was a really big legacy for Qatar, specifically just in Education City. Um, we did an accessibility audit. You would think with Renaud, with Ausage, with all of our ability-friendly programs, we're actually a really accessible campus. That audit made us have a really good hard look at our city and we saw that actually we weren't that accessible. And essentially ahead of the World Cup, we did a slew of construction amendments to be able to be accessible for the World Cup so that a wheelchair could get from the parking lot to the stadium. But that also meant that we looked at the entire campus and we looked at where not only for the World Cup but where we can improve beyond that and that's a longer term five-year plan that we're now looking at that's like a hard actual tangible legacy you talk about emotional legacy but that's an actual legacy that the World Cup will leave for Education City the other component around it was inclusion so that's accessibility for people with different abilities um, the, the sort of improvement and increase of women and girls sports as a result of the World Cup, we've been seeing sort of a, a slow sort of uptick over the last seven years. This has become a priority for Qatar Foundation. How can we really harness the excitement of the World Cup to encourage more girls and women to participate in sport across the board? And that's not just at the elite and professional level, that's at the community level. That's everything from taking a jog in a park through to joining a basketball league, through to how can we get more gold medalists in, in the Olympics. Um, so that's something that Qatar Foundation has really um, taken to heart and, and grabbed with, with um, both hands. Um, and right now we are supporting a national effort on a unified women and girls sports strategy, which will essentially thread throughout the sports ministry, the QOC, QFA, et cetera. 
um, as well as working with community groups and our own QF programs to ensure that we have the resources, the skills, the coaches, um, and the pipeline to be able to encourage more girls to play sports. And all of this ideally, um, hopefully, will be underpinned by our legacy plan for Education City Stadium, which um, will become a home for women and girls sports. So we're in current planning mode for that right now. We had our first um, ever women and girls community and grassroots football tournament that took place last year. Um, the second edition had doubled the amount of girls and women that took place on National Sport Day this year in Education City Stadium. So just in that sense, we essentially um, were the first, uh, the first event to take place after the World Cup in our stadium was an event just for women and girls. And it was ladies only, and women could come there. They could participate in whatever way that they wanted. Um, and we had 500 girls and women participate. So for, for me, that is an actual kind of tangible outcome and legacy of the World Cup that we're really excited about. And also, it's not only just a first for the country, but transforming a major sporting event stadium from a World Cup stadium into a home that's specifically something that feels like can be a safe space for women and girls has never been done before. So I'm really proud to say that it's also not just a Qatar first, but it's a world first. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel, you're our faculty lead for our project at CRS. Uh, it's called Building a Legacy, uh, Qatar FIFA World Cup 2022. Uh, can you tell us some of the major pillars and topics that were part of the project and how uh, the World Cup impacted Qatar? I think the World Cup largely impacted Qatar, but we should also not exaggerate the role of FIFA when discussing social changes in the country. This country started to change in the 1990s. There was a 1995 a leadership change in 1997. Qatar started to export liquefied natural gas for the first time with a shipment to Japan. And uh, many other changes occurred in the 1990s, uh, Al Jazeera in 1996, uh, Qatar Airways 1993, uh, Education City was established in the late 1990s, uh, Georgetown in started in 2005. Uh, in 2008, Qatar um, 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 published its Qatar National Vision, which states that Qatar wants to become an advanced country by 2030. So all of this happened before FIFA decided in December 2010 to award the World Cup to Qatar. Um, however, I think there is certainly one area which we also largely discussed uh, in the research initiative uh, where the World Cup has a major impact on, on the country, and this is migrant worker rights. So um, the um, World Cup put a lot of spotlight on, on shortcomings in the country when it comes to the working and living conditions of the migrant workers. And um, uh, international human rights groups um, 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 and international media um, would uh, highlight uh, shortcomings. And, um, and the EMEA last year in a big interview with the French newspaper Le Point uh, admitted that there were shortcomings and also uh, said that he's grateful that the World Cup gave the opportunity to uh, start uh, changes. And uh, one could argue that some of the changes took a little bit too much time and were mainly implemented after most of the infrastructure was already built. Um, but uh, certainly we have witnessed in this country in the last three years um, firework of reforms when it comes to uh, migrant worker rights. Qatar has uh, first minimum wage in the region and uh, the kafala system was dismantled so one can now switch jobs without uh, approval from the employer. One can leave the country without that the sponsor needs to approve this. And I think most groundbreaking is maybe uh, the extension of the summer working hours where outside work is not permitted anymore. Um, so this is since 2021. Um, it's from um, June 1st until September 15, outside work is not permitted anymore from 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. I think this is really groundbreaking and sets a very high standard. Um, and um, yeah, when it comes to sports, when I should just talk about sport, um, I think it's the same um, that, um, you know, Qatar, um, 
became member of FIFA before it, it, it even became an independent country. So it was one of the country's priorities to become like a, a member in international sports. It participated uh, for the first time in the Olympics in 1984. Uh, and um, in 1993, it hosted the first ATP tennis men's tournament. So since 30 years, it's now a reliable host of um, international sporting events. Um, and uh, in 2001, it established the Qatar Women's Sports Committee. So, uh, um, so there is a trajectory of, of um, um, building and improving the sports sector. Uh, but certainly, um, when Qatar was awarded the FIFA World Cup in December 2010, I think the country became even more active uh, on sports, both on the professional and on the grassroots level. When it comes to the professional level, it took only days after Qatar became the World Cup host that its Qatar Foundation signed a sponsorship with Barcelona. Uh, Bayern Munich did its first winter practice camp here in January 2011. Um, and uh, also in 2011, uh, Qatar purchased uh, Paris Saint-Germain. Um, and um, but but on the grassroots level, I mean, we, we tend to talk uh, when we talk about sports mainly on on elite elite sports. But I think what is affecting most of us is <laughs> is the grassroots sports level. So Qatar became one of the uh, few countries in the world that dedicated a national public holiday to the promotion of sport. So since 2012, uh, every year, including the COVID years, although then some activities were mainly online, but since 2012, there is a, a second Tuesday in February, a public holiday to the promotion of sports. And um, since 2013, there is a marathon in the country. So this year in January, uh, there were 8,000 uh, participants uh, at the marathon. So we, we've seen lots of activities both on the uh, professional and on the grassroots level. What I forgot to mention is that already in 2004, Aspire Academy was established. Uh, and I just had recently the um, honor to um, visit with my students, uh, the academy. It's, it's really impressive. And um, there are 200 uh, full-time students who live and train under one roof. But all the 200, and I think there's no other facility in the world which provides, um, you know, uh, such services. And, um, but there are 200 boys. And I think now the next challenge is that we give female athletes the same opportunities as the country has given male athletes uh, with remarkable success. I mean, I know there's a lot of complaint about the performance of the Qatar national team at the World Cup, but this is a very small country and the, the player base is very small. So, I, And, uh, you know, the team won the Asian Cup 2019, which is remarkable. And uh, Aspire graduates became Olympic champions like Mutas Bashim, the high jumper. So I think it's a success story, and I wish that a similar success story will be written in the future uh, for female athletes uh, with the help of Qatar Foundation and its ambitious plans for Education City Stadium. Thank you. And thank you. And very briefly, Daniel, can, uh, how can people find out about the research project that you lead? Um, well, we have a wonderful website. Um, and um, we have a podcast. So you can subscribe to that podcast on all common podcast, plas podcast platforms. And we have a blog. And we have an expert uh, group that is working on a, a book, pu book publication. This takes a bit long. But our objective was uh, that we would uh, contribute to constant knowledge production because academia is the main weakness of academia is that it's so slow. And um, the book we are working on, um, um, who knows when it's going to be published, certainly not before 2024, but we contributed to a constant knowledge production, uh, discussing the impact of the World Cup on politics and society of Qatar and its international relations. And we were the only academic institutions that did so from within the country, because the main weakness of the discourse about Qatar is that most people who comment Qatari politics and society do so from outside the country. So we have done so from within the country. Thank you. Uh, and Zaid, coming back to you, uh, what advice would you give future sports entities uh, when they're delivering international uh, tournaments? 
Okay. Um, well, maybe some of you are going to be working for future sports entities here in Qatar or, or, or already are. Um, so, I suppose this, let's, let's, let's say there's three main areas that I'd focus on. So, whenever you're delivering a major event, they're never the same. So, the first thing you need to do is you need to speak to your key stakeholders. So, when, when I talked before about the impact of the tournament, you, you should start there and you want to know what the impact of the tournament is going to be. And then you work back from there to work out how you're going to deliver it. So whether that's from a, a social perspective in terms of what are the three to five things that you want somebody visiting your country to walk away with, uh, or is it more of a, a structural thing where we're talking about building uh, you know, a, a place and a home for women's sport. So understanding that from the top, and then not just from the, pe the people here in, in Qatar, but also you'll have a, a sports organization. Uh, we had one called FIFA, and they had their own thoughts on things. Um, usually they, they push us in one direction and we want to go in another direction. But at the end of the day, you find a happy medium to work with. So understanding your goals and, and, and delivering those is, is really key. Um, the, the second thing is, um, as well as that structure that that brings, um, you want to be, be prepared for anything, really. So anything in terms of um, we had um, a blockade, we had... Um, uh, we had, co we, had, we had COVID. We had FIFA imploding when we first kicked off. Um, I was expecting aliens to land at the start of the tournament. So um, you just need to be ready for absolutely everything, but in a positive way as well. So innovation comes. People come with ideas. You may have your structure and your focus, but if an innovation comes with good ideas, don't be afraid to use those ideas as well. Um, and that's working very, very closely with stakeholders here in Qatar as well, because a lot of the time people would come and we would say, hmm, that's really this ministry, that's, uh, that's their roles and responsibility, but we'll introduce you to them and um, we'll work with you, with them to, to deliver things because um, this whole World Cup was delivered by everybody you know, in the whole of Qatar, it doesn't matter who you are, what organization, what person, everybody was involved um, throughout the tournament for this event and the same will be for future events as well. So just being prepared for that. And the final thing, which is most important of all, you just need to have fun. So a lot of the times things get too stressful, and if that happens, um, you know the output's not as good as it should be. If you keep things light, you keep things enjoyable, um, and you know um, you only live once, and you get an opportunity in such a great country and in such a great region where you don't just get the World Cup, but then you get the Asian Cup nine months later. I mean, you don't get that anywhere else in the world. So um, just keep smiling and enjoy it. Excellent. Thank you. And Alexandra, what key legacy projects are you working on or focusing on as a result of the World Cup? Well, firstly, just to say, it's nice to say that in hindsight, isn't it, Zaid? <laughs> let's, let's roll back to six months ago and see if he was smiling like this. Just have fun. It's amazing. Um, but I do have to say that as um, someone who worked on 2010 in South Africa and Brazil 2014 and Rio 2016 and London 2012, which obviously Zaid did as well, um, I did, I felt like I was that, I was that voice. I was like, just wait, like the spirit will come. It, it is an amazing, you cannot replicate or explain the spirit of the World Cup, but it will come when everyone was so stressed and, and worried, and it did, obviously, but in a way that no one could have ever imagined. Um, in terms of projects, I already shared the, the, um, the priority project that I'm working on is this uh, Women and Girls Sports Initiative, which is both has a national component as well as here in QF and, and the Education City Stadium um, transformation. We're also really looking heavily at school sports. Um, something that the World Cup really brought to life was, um, was a, a, a passion and excitement amongst our students um, here in, in QF, um, the K through 12, but also uh, QF universities as well. Um, but we really realized that actually our, our infrastructure and our framework is, is not quite there to, to really kind of create the, the pipeline that we need, the physical literacy that we'd love to see um, with, with our young people that are coming through QF's programs, but also just generally through QF school, um, Qatar schools. Um, so we're, we're really working with the Ministry of Education, the Sports Ministry, and then just within our pre-university education team and our higher education team to, to look at what, what success looks like um, from a school sport, sports perspective, um, having really um, 
a conducive and comprehensive PE, uh, as well as after school programs that link into our existing after school uh, programs, whether that be PSG or Evo or whatever. Um, and then through to really instilling a strong um, university sport framework. And what, what would that take and what does that mean? Because we know that a strong sports um, program at universities um, engages great, um, great qualities of students, it instills loyalty in our alumni. So we know that there's a benefit there. Um, so we're really looking at that. So that's exciting. And then the other one um, is really kind of uh, looking at that, that piece around educating the rest of the world of, um, about the, um, the Arab world and preserving Arabic language and encouraging and educating people around the Arabic language as well as the heritage and the history of this place. Um, during the World Cup, we used that, um, that, the opportunity of having thousands of fans come here to share um, Al Qatar House. We, we um, uh, didn't refurbish it, but we, we refreshed it and we um, reopened it, so to speak. Al Qatar House, just around the corner from here, you guys have probably seen it, um, come to life. Um, we moved Torba so that it was closer to there so we could get more footfall so people could understand and learn about the stories of some of our uh, some of the oldest families. I'm already speaking like I'm Qatari, <laughs> obviously I'm not. Um, but there were there were things like that. We had Darisha Performing Arts Festival. It was the region's first ever performing arts festival, and it focused specifically on unearthing performing artists from this region and what that looks like through um, themes around travel and um, Arabic invention and exploration and that type of thing. Um, so a big project that we're working on is how we continue to grow that and use the kind of popularity that, that we had around the World Cup to continue to, to um, have passion and excitement around that, especially from our younger generation. So we're looking at that, what that looks like from a Darisha perspective, a performing arts center, making sure that that kind of comes through. We're looking at how we can um, continue an invention education um, space um, that will connect to two of our schools, CAST and Academiati. Um, and then we're also looking at how we can further um, activate and tell the oral history um, around the, the history here through Al Qatar House and various projects with QL. and l um, So that's really exciting. And then obviously that kind of comes to life in a really exciting way with TED in Arabic, which will be taking place at QNCC literally in a week and a half. So you should all look into that. That's a really exciting platform that um, celebrates the Arabic language and storytelling in Arabic with one of the most amazing entities worldwide in storytelling. Thank you. And Daniel, uh, looking at the future of academic research about the World Cup, do you think uh, academic institutions like Georgetown should continue studying the World Cup and why? Yeah, I think sport will remain an important uh, domestic and foreign policy tool for Qatar. And uh, when it comes specifically to the World Cup, I think um, we uh, one of the topics we could study is uh, post-event use of the facilities. Um, and um, the history of the World Cup and the Olympics is a history of white elephants, of infrastructure being created but not used after the event. Qatar has announced very ambitious plans. We have learned about some of them tonight. But of course, it's not just about talking, it's also about implementing. So that's something that um, yeah, uh, we, uh, as an academic uh, institution, can, can monitor. Uh, and um, um, also, like um, we have the Asian uh, Cup next year and, and the, uh, um, the Asian Games in 2030 which I believe is a wonderful opportunity to uh, improve, um, the, to further improve the sporting infrastructure uh, of the country, uh, particularly also uh, for, for those sports that are popular amongst the largest communities in the country. And I'm thinking particularly about cricket. I think cricket deserves more um, support uh, in the country and uh, people shouldn't play Friday mornings on parking slots. They should have proper facilities. Um, then, of course, it will be interesting to see, uh, there was this argument prior to the World Cup uh, uh, in the West, uh, in some Western media, that some of the reforms would be just for show. I don't think so that's the case. I think the country is really committed uh, to uh, for change, but of course it remains to see uh, um, whether social changes that have uh, started will continue or be even improved. I think it's time to increase the minimum wage, for example. Um, and um, 
Then, uh, of course, when it comes to foreign policy, um, uh, I think that Qatar standing in the world has uh, already improved a lot. Um, and Qatar became kind of like a global source champion now with the World Cup, but you know, already before with evacuating refugees from Afghanistan, with mediating many conflicts, I think Qatar standing in the world is pretty good. And the World Cup might um, contribute to, uh, to, to even better the standing of the country in the world. Last comment, uh, we have the privilege at Georgian University to be one of the few institutions that's located in the country that hosted the 2022 World Cup and the 2026 World Cup in the US. Although Washington DC unfortunately was not chosen as um, a location of matches, but still it's uh, in the country uh, of the uh, 2026 World Cup and some stadiums such as in New York or Philadelphia are not that far away. And uh, I, I, I would like to second what uh, Lex said, that, um, and Zaid said there, there are, I think, lots of lessons that can be learned from Qatar, even if countries and cultures are different. Of course, there will be alcohol, for example, in the stadiums in, 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 in the US, for example, but, but many other issues. Uh, uh, I mean, I had, I had a number of visitors, and they were really impressed like by going to the stadiums, how well it was organized, the public transportation, and the safety in the stadium. So I think the entire logistics, uh, uh, you know, safety uh, was perfect and uh, accessibility, what you mentioned, and uh, the sustainability concept. I think uh, although the US is like a sporting nation and they have so much more experience, I think there's, there's a lot they can also learn from us here. And um, so I think for us as an academic institution, it's, it's a great opportunity to to share lessons, but of course also to to look ahead and um, and um, look at the 2026 World Cup, which will have some first. This was the first World Cup in the Middle East, and it will be the first World Cup with 48 teams and the first World Cup in three countries. So it will be uh, as exciting, I think, as this World Cup. Thank you. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes uh, for questions, so I'd like to open up the floor if anyone has a question. Yes, sir? In the third row, in the second row, and then in the third row. In terms of um, economic diversification, I'll leave this open to the panel. What has, have we seen anything in terms of foreign direct investment as a result of the World Cup? And towards economic diversification. Who would like to take that? Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we we obviously worked very closely, especially when it came to our stadiums, because they were the major investments. So we worked with uh, a number of different um, companies that were from different countries. Um, now those. Uh, companies can be awarded um, through a traditional um, procurement, but also there were um, discussions from a geopolitical side of things as well for certain cases. So we had different com countries from around the world uh, working with us. I think we had a Belgian company uh, working with us, um, uh, co um, contracting one of the stadiums. We also had a, a Chinese company uh, working with us. So some thought was uh, went into the different companies uh, that were around, and I'm sure there were a lot more geopolitical decisions around um, stadium, um, uh, um, yeah, the, the decision on who to, to, to build each stadium. Um, in terms of the, the internal um, investment, around about 90% of our awards actually went to Qatari companies. Now, that will be both Qatari directly and also partnerships. So I've not broken that down, but in some way, there's a lot of um, benefits came to uh, companies internally. Uh, but in terms of foreign direct investment, I think the main area is really just with the stadiums and, and the work that we did there. Yeah, so I mean, we've, we've, we've had a lot of legacy plans in place. One of the main things that came about was, um, uh, so when, when you deliver a World Cup, you obviously have the economic benefit that comes from the World Cup itself. And then after the World Cup, there's usually probably around about 30 to 50% extra in economic benefit that comes from that uh, from the tournament itself, whether it's the decommissioning of stadium, stadiums or the changing them from 40,000 seats to 20,000 seats. There's economic work that needs to be done there and people are getting paid. So that all needs to come. The only thing that slowed things down for 
in a positive way is is that um, we've won the Asian Cup and we also need those stadiums um, for that tournament as well. So at this moment in time, um, things are being placed on pause and then we'll see after that. Um, foreign direct investment from other areas, the, the majority of the spend was on the infrastructure, not related to the tournament. And really from our side, we had about 6.7 billion on the stadiums itself, which we spent in US dollars. And to come, it's really the decommissioning, the moving of 974, these elements, which are the big pieces. Um, the other bits that come through are really in terms of um, human capabilities um, and, and uh, the capacity building that we've had here in the country. I hope that answers your question. Thank yeah. you. Gentlemen in the third row. Sure. Um, thank you all for sharing your experiences with us. Um, Part of the planning for anything is to anticipate what's going to happen from financial point of view, from environmental point of view, and so on. So people do impact studies. Um, certainly you have done your share of impact studies in environment, finance, um, socioeconomics, and so on. Other than what you told us that, you know, like the finance, um, uh, the purging of, you know, like 12 billion and getting about 16 billion, what other impacts have you anticipated and it exceeded your expectation and what didn't? This question is for both Zaid and Alexandra. <laughs> okay. okay, great question. Um, so at the start of every tournament, you write something called a bid book. So it's something that you aspire to, well, it wins, it wins the, uh, the bid that you're bidding against other countries. So a lot of the time, you're trying to do the very, very best you can in this book so that FIFA or the events organizer ends up choosing you. But in there, that in essence lays out the strategy that you are to follow for the tournament. So in that bid book, we made a lot of promises. Those promises were we were going to have a carbon neutral tournament. That's something that we delivered. Those promises were we were going to have uh, Generation Amazing because it was already a, a program that we were running. Um, I think with Generation Amazing, we didn't set a target, but um, I think that we have over exceeded because we've delivered to 75 different countries around the world and we've actually touched and supported um, over a million people. And the work that we've done with um, Generation Amazing and Qatar Foundation with refugees, um, uh, you know, in specific circumstances as well. Um, these things you can't plan for, but as and when they occur, um, there was a program in place to support those things. So um, in terms of meeting the expectations, we went through the bid book to make sure that we, um, you know, ticked off or made sure that we um, had impact with the, uh, uh, which linked ourselves to what we promised to make sure that we delivered on this epic journey. To, 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 to the world and to the people here in Qatar. Um, from my personal side, I think that where we exceeded expectations, um, we always wanted people to understand the region. We always said that this was a tournament for the region. Um, and um, we could have done a lot more, um, but without, without really pushing that um, topic or that theme as hard as we could have done, um, naturally that just came about uh, people from the region, um, a lot of them came and watched the, the tournament. Um, a lot of them were cheering the teams on, as we mentioned. And that Arab unity, you could feel it um, through every single game and through people coming to, to watch the games as well. So um, that's something we achieved and the international understanding of Qatar. We never anticipated, um, rightly or wrongly, that we would have such negative press against Qatar as a country. And that's something that we... Um, managed and worked with various different entities here in Qatar to um, to improve as the tournament progressed but well as the as the, the years progressed but it was only really when it came to the tournament and people really start to look into the details of um, the numbers w which were being shared in the, the press and people realized the lies behind them and then they could see through those um, those curtains and, and, and see the real Qatar, the real culture, the real people, the people that came here. And because we had a com such a compact tournament, you had the, the French people mixing with the, um, the Qatari people, mix, mixing with the Japanese people, and everybody was in a, a compact place. That cultural understanding of everybody coming together in this 
like footballing melting pots of what FIFA described it, a football uh, wonderland, you know, um, was something that we couldn't have experienced. We talked about it a lot, but it was only when it actually happened at the tournament and the people came here, which was, was when was when the the magic happened, so to speak. So you can write a lot of things down, you can strategize, and you can hope things turn out for the best. But to be honest, it's only when people come together, and we were fortunate. Um, the games also were extremely interesting, that everything came together and exceeded our expectations in that way. I think uh, we should not see the World Cup just in pure economic terms. And uh, first of all, I cannot recall any other mega sporting event in the world that has been so well integrated into national development planning. Uh, the metro has not been built because of the World Cup. It, has, it was planned anyway, but the World Cup just set a timeline when to, 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 to finish it. And this applies to many of the infrastructure projects. So that's one. And secondly, um, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, nobody knew Qatar. Now everybody knows Qatar. And um, Qatar is uh, a punching far above its uh, weight in international affairs. And uh, the sporting investments, in particular the World Cup, have also contributed to the national security of the country. And, I mean, it's impressive how we all survived here, the blockade from June 2017 to June 2021. And I think the World Cup helped with that. So uh, Qatar is a small state, and sport helps the country uh, in its uh, national security, but also to be more influential in international affairs. And this is priceless. So from a Qatar Foundation perspective, um, Qatar Foundation's perspective, the, the sort of stance we took around the impact of the World Cup was very much around what QF stands for, which is unlocking human potential, right? Around education, research, community development programs, et cetera. So when we looked at what is the impact that we want to make and when we're thinking about impact, we're thinking about long term. Right, like the vision that Her Highness and His Highness had for QF 25 plus years ago is started coming to life 10 years down the line, right? There is a long-term vision around what QF is trying to do. So what we were looking at with the World Cup is what does this really mean? And where we sort of started, to Zaid's point, is like look at what kind of impact you want to have. The thing that felt the most resounding was an entire generation here grew up with having the World Cup as this thing. Right? It was the first ever time that a World Cup was awarded that far in advance, 12 years. So you had people growing up, young people growing up, knowing that the World Cup was coming. How can we, how can we capitalize on that? To your point, the nation, National Sport Day, um, ensuring that uh, people wanted to be part of sports. What does that look like starting Q Qatar community, football leagues, these types of things. So for us, looking at that, and that's how we sort of developed our programming, whether that be ability-friendly football program or our goals program, which all, was all around storytelling from our perspective, from the people who live here's perspective on the impact of the World Cup and what does that look like, that will continue to, to go. So all of these sort of football programs that also contribute to education and development of young people were started when, when these young people were kind of growing up in our, in our schools and knew that the World Cup was coming, and now they're in university, right? And it's over, and what happens next? Where's the next kind of generation coming? So I think from, from that perspective, that is like the, the longer term, more strategic impact that we were looking at. From a personal perspective, two components that I never ever saw coming. The first was the refugee crisis around Afghanistan um, happening literally the, the six, what was it, like six months before the World Cup? Um, or okay, just nine, nine, ten months before the World Cup, um, and the way that we supported in um, the compounds, as they were called, of, of the Afghan refugees or um, displaced people here, was through sports and through football. And we could do that because Generation Amazing existed, QF's football programs existed, Qatar Charity, all of these entities that ha were set up to do these kinds of programming. Um, and that's because of the World Cup, and you could have never seen that. And that literally like, saved some of these young people who were traumatized and who had been displaced from their families. So you could have never seen, and that impact will live on. I'm still getting personal what's-ups from young people who are now in Sydney or in Toronto who 
literally lived here for six months and were taking our programs and they they like thank us and are grateful for us and actually credit those programs and what happened to how they are right now you know could have never seen that coming so personally I feel like that's the most unexpected impact that that happened What's the American University of Afghanistan now here yes so the ro and the robotics team and I mean this comes out in the impact report, but we're currently housing um, a group of Syrian refugees who are here training at Lucille FC. We just supported 10, funded 10 girls in Palestine in the in Tulkan refugee camp there, um, their, their education, and hopefully they will actually in two years be able to continue their education here at, at QF or beyond. So yeah, there is a, an entire kind of galvanization around supporting the, those who are displaced or, ref, or refugees. And I don't think that resource-wise, Qatar could have necessarily done it in that, sport, in that sports and social change angle if it wasn't for the World Cup. Thank you. Uh, we have time only for a couple of brief questions and brief answers. And if you could direct your question to one of the panelists. Yes, ma'am. Well, this question is actually directed towards if, George. Uh, if we could use the mic because we're recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, this question is actually directed towards Georgetown. It relates to legacy. And what we've been dis discussing tonight is legacy and legacy in Qatar. And what I'm interested with the upcoming um, games going to be in the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, how that legacy, because the legacy components of this, what you've all been, ta what you've been talking about, dealing with women in sports and all of these different things, my concern as an American, another American sitting friend of mine over here, mm -hmm. um, is how is Georgetown, although there's no games scheduled for Washington, D.C., how is Georgetown as a leading university in the United States, right in the center of power, how are you going to be using the lessons learned on legacy to make sure that it's not just a legacy that happens here in Qatar, mm -hmm. it's that it's a legacy that happens because my concern is, is was it going to be like a Super Bowl kind of thing in the U.S., where it's all a big capitalist sort of, sorry, I don't mean to be cap, but, you know, big money-making uh, uh, event mm -hmm. where it doesn't have anything to do with legacy. And I think that what the lessons that are coming out of this are in what Qatar should treasure is that they've really created something different and unique that could really be um, magnified in the upcoming games, and I'm just wondering, Georgetown as major university and the work that you're working on, what are your plans for making sure that the policymakers in Washington and Mexico and Canada are actually listening to the really importance of legacy? Thank you. Uh, that's for you, Daniel. Uh, we don't. We don't have much time, so. Four people. Yes. Would you want to answer this one specifically first? This is about Georgetown. Um, yeah, very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't say much. I mean, we we have started conversations uh, with main campus. Uh, how how um, you know um, from our experience can be learned and maybe common initiatives. But I can't say much at this point. Um, but I, I certainly think that uh, lots can be learned from 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 Qatar. Can I can I share just something? So. Because we have had a lot of conversations um, with MLSE in Toronto, LAFC in LA, um, Philadelphia Union. Um, so the the difference is that it's an it's going to be a totally localized World Cup. So LA organizing committee is going to do their games. Toronto is going to do their games. Mexico City is going to do their games, and they're going to be focused on their stuff. So the difference is that you don't have this, as you said, integrated, embedded, national vision that everyone's pulling together. So I think in terms of how you can support is that kind of those, those papers and the, the podcasts and the communication and help the connectivity of like what everyone is doing. Um, because I feel like the, it, it has the potential to be really disjointed. And that could be something that Georgetown could yeah, really so help. The groundbreaking, of course, about 2026 is that it's by three countries. Of course, the U.S. could do it by themselves. Uh, but in general, the idea of co-hosting is uh, very good um, because costs can be shared and the economic, uh, environmental impact can be reduced, etc. So, And I think by having this 2026 World Cup in three countries, 
um, this will uh, make it more common in the future that big events are co-hosted. So I think, and of course, it, you know, the bit happened at a certain time when there was a different president in the U.S., so it was also a chance to show uh, collaboration in times of uh, ethnic nationalism. Uh, we are out of time, however, we do have a reception outside and our three speakers are here, so please uh, direct your questions to them and let's thank them very much.